To my YouTube listeners, if you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, please subscribe. It'll make a big difference for the Hasidic Story Project. This is the Hasidic Story Project with Barack Holman, podcasting from Jerusalem, Israel. This podcast is sponsored by listeners just like you. To become a supporter of this podcast, please go to HasidicStory.com. H-A-S-I-D-I-C Story.com. You'll never know. You'll never know. You'll never know. You'll never know. A very wealthy Jew came to the Holy Rebbe, the Hidig Abal Shem Tov, after waiting in line for many hours to see the Rebbe. And when he's finally face to face with the Baal Shem Tov, Baal Shem Tov says to him, What can I do for you, my sweetest friend? And the wealthy Jew says, Rebbe, Bao Hashem, thank God. I don't need anything. And so the Baal Shem Tov said to him, there's no such thing as a person that doesn't need something. Everybody has something that they need. And the wealthy Jew says, no, I have plenty of money. I have money to support myself and all the members of my family. I learned Torah. I give tzedakah. I really have everything. But I figured here I'm passing through Meshibuz. And you're a great Rebbe. It's only right to come and say to you, Shalom Aleichem. And the Baal Shem Tov says to him, Aleichem Shalom. But again, don't you need something, a blessing or advice or something like that? And the wealthy Jew says, no, Rebbe, I really just came to say hi. So the Baal Shem Tov looks at the wealthy Jew and he says, well, if that's the case, but you don't really need anything, I'll give you something. I'll tell you a story. And this is the story that the Baal Shem Tov told the wealthy Jew. He said in a certain town in Poland, there were two religious Jews, two boys who grew up together in Cheder and then continued studying in the yeshiva afterwards. And these two were really good friends. They really hit it off with one another. And they made a decision that they would remain friends forever. And it reached the point where it was time for them to get married. And each was offered a shidduch. One married a girl from the city that they grew up in together and remained there. The other married a girl from Berdichev and he went to live with her family. Of course, they both attended each other's weddings. And as they're about to go on their way to their different towns, one friend turns to the other. He says, I promise you, my friend, we will always be there for one another. Please make sure you write to me and stay in touch. And so they did for many years. But they had children, and they started businesses, and life got a little overwhelming. And eventually, they stopped writing to one another. And as everyone knows, there's the Wheel of Fortune. Sometimes you're on the top, sometimes you're on the bottom, and sometimes you're heading up or you're heading down. The friend who remained in the hometown where the two friends had grown up became very wealthy, and every business that he began was more successful than the last one. He built a large home. He supported Torah institutions. He gave a lot of tzedakah. Whereas his friend would move to Berdichev, things didn't work out so well for him. He did have a successful business for a while, but then, as things happen in life sometimes, he made one wrong decision and another. Before he knew it, he had to sell everything, all of his property and all of his possessions and he had no choice but to go around begging for money. And he was begging for a few months, and he was pretty miserable. He's thinking, if I could just get a loan and get back on my feet, I could stop begging. And then he remembered his old friend. But the two of them had promised one another to always be there for each other. And so he says to his wife, I'm going to go to my old friend, back to my hometown. And Bezat Hashem, he'll be successful, and he'll be able to lend me some money. And when he arrives at his friend's house, his friend was so happy to see him because they really were very good friends. And they were both sorry that they had lost touch with one another. The wealthy friend who had remained in the hometown he looks at his friend who had moved to Berchichev and he said, What happened? You look like a beggar. He said, I am. He said, How could that be? He said, Well, I started a business and at first it was successful. And then things turned around and I lost everything. And I thought about you and I figured I'd come here and get a loan from you. And the friend says... You think I would give you a loan? You came to me for a loan? The beggar was a little disappointed because he thought they were really good friends. And he said, yeah, I figured you would lend me some money. He said, I would never lend you any money. I'll give you money. How much money do you need? You know what? Don't even tell me. I'm going to calculate how much half of my fortune is. And I'm going to give it to you. No conditions. And you don't have to pay anything back. You're my friend and we swore to one another. We'd always be there for each other. Within a few days, he had made his calculation and handed his old friend a huge fortune. 
And he returns to Berdichev, pays off all of his debts, buys his home back. This time he starts another business, and he's truly successful. And he never forgot his old friend, who was so generous with him. But the old friend, after he gave away half of his fortune, things didn't work out for him. One business deal didn't work out, and another one. Before he knew it, he had a great deal of debt, and he didn't get to the point where he was begging yet. But he figured, I'll go to my old friend in Berdichev and get a loan from him. And when he arrives, he sees that his old friend, that he had given half of his fortune to, had become extremely wealthy, was living in a mansion. And now, the other friend was feeling very confident. He said, I'm sure that he's going to help me out. Just like I helped him, he'll help me. And he knocks on the door of the mansion. Shalom Aleichem, Aleichem Shalom. What brings you here, my friend? He said, you know, you remember I gave you some money, half of my fortune. He said, yes, I'm forever grateful for you. He said, well, now it's me coming to you, my friend. We need to borrow some money. The friend in Berdichev, he says, you want me to lend you some money? He said, yeah, yeah, you know, I gave you half of everything I owned. I'm just asking for a little loan to help me get back on my feet again. The friend in Berdichev said, I'm sorry, I can't help you. And the generous friend said, what are you talking about? You can't help me. He said, don't you see what's going on here? When you're wealthy, I'm poor. When I'm poor, you're wealthy. If I give you money now and you become wealthy again, I'll lose everything. I'll be poor again. You can't ask a man to dig his own grave. Believe me, I would love to help you, but I can't. And the generous friend was shocked. He never imagined he would hear such words from his old friend. They loved each other so much, and this is the way he's being treated. But the generous friend, he had a Muna. He had faith in Hashem. And he said, fine, Hashem. You don't want to give me money through my old friend who I helped out. So now, Hashem, you'll figure out how to give me money from another place. But I don't want to be a beggar. And the merit of my helping my old friend. Now, Hashem, you have to help me. But no help came. And things were getting harder and harder. And then one day, a generous friend, he remembers that the community gives out loans to help people get back on their feet. And he went and explained to them that he needed a loan to get back into business. And they knew he was an honest man. He took a loan. One thing led to another. The generous friend who remained in the hometown, he became wealthy again. But just like the friend of Berdichev had predicted, when one became wealthy, the other became poor. And now the Jew in Berdichev started losing his money left and right. And he didn't know what to do. He knew it was chutzpah, but he went to his old friend, the generous one. And he said, my friend, I'm so sorry how I treated you. I thought that I could figure things out, and that I was running the world, and Hashem wasn't running the world. But now I see it doesn't matter. And I'm really sorry that I didn't give you money when you came to me. But now I've lost everything, and I need help again. And the generous friend, he had no ill will. He said, just like the first time, I will give you half of my fortune. And I will trust that Hashem will never abandon me. Should you become wealthy and I become poor again, or I become wealthy and you become poor again, everything is from Hashem. So here you go. Here's half of my fortune. And this went on for many decades. One of them would lose the money. The other one would help him out. Wealthy, poor, wealthy, poor. Till eventually, they were old men, and they passed away on the same day. And now both of their neshamas, both of their souls, are standing in front of the heavenly court, and they're being questioned about their actions in this world. And it was decided by the Beit Din Shalmala, the heavenly court up above, that the generous friend would go to Gan Eden, would go to heaven, and the ungrateful friend would go to Geinom, would go to be punished. But when the generous friend heard this, he said to the Beit Din, he said to the court, I am not going to Gan Eden without my old friend. It's not his fault. He thought that he could trick Hashem, but he couldn't. And we did help each other out over all those years. I mean, we had a life together. We were friends in Cheder, in Yeshiva, and in business. I'm not going to Gan Eden without my friend. And so the heavenly court said, okay, both of your souls are going to go down to earth again. The generous friend would live in abject poverty. He would be poor, whereas the ungrateful friend, he would be super wealthy. And if the super wealthy, ungrateful friend was able to do tshuva and fix his actions from his previous life, then he would be allowed to go in Gan Eden into heaven. But this was his only chance. 
No more chances for that soul. And so they were both put back into this world. They grew up. The generous friend who was now very poor one day knocks on the door of his super wealthy friend. And he sees there's a guard at the door who wouldn't let him in. But he's banging on the gate and the door and he says, let me in. I want to see the Balabite, the master of the house. And when the soul of the ungrateful friend, who was the wealthy Jew, he sees this poor Jew outside of his house. He tells his servant to throw him down the stairs. And the soul of the generous friend, who was reincarnated to be this poor Jew, falls down the stairs. And is so injured that he can't walk. Eventually, his family comes and they carry him back home. And the Baal Shem Tov now leans back in his chair and he looks at the wealthy Jew who had come to visit him, whose face had turned white. And the Baal Shem Tov says to him, So what do you think about my little story? It's a nice story, right? And the wealthy Jew is so shocked he can't even speak. And the Baal Shem Tov said, I thought you came here just to say Shalom Aleichem. You didn't need any advice or blessing or anything. And the wealthy Jew says, I am the wicked man who hardened his heart towards the beggar and had him thrown down the stairs. Oh my God, what did I do? What's wrong with me? The Baal Shem Tov looked at this man and he said, didn't you tell me just 20 minutes ago that you didn't need any help? And I said to you, is there such a person who doesn't need any help or any advice or any blessing whatsoever? The wealthy Jew, really ashamed of himself, he looks at the Rebbe and he says, Holy Rebbe, what can I do now? Can I still do tshuva? The Baal Shem Tov said, yes. Go home immediately and find the family of that poor Jew that you had thrown down the stairs. And you go and support them and you help him. And hopefully he'll recover from his wounds that you caused. And you will make him into your tzedakah distributor. You will give him huge amounts of money. The two of you will distribute them to poor Jews in need. And his family will never lack for anything. And even if it needs to be, you will take care of his wounds by yourself. Because as we know, Utshuva, Utfila, Utsdaka, Maavirim, Etroa, Hagzeira. And Tshuva comes about repentance through davening and tzedakah. And of course, the wealthy Jew did exactly what the Hele Gabal Shem Tov said and did Tshuva. And when his soul reached the heavenly court, he was brought into Gan Eden. Really, only in the merit of his old, generous friend. And so, my sweetest friends, learn from this story. Don't wait for a Baal Shem Tov or the heavenly court. Just help your fellow Jews right now, in every way you can, all the time. Don't make any accounting. Whenever there's an opportunity, take advantage of it. So I have another story for you, and I figured since I'm telling Baal Shem Tov stories, I'll tell another Baal Shem Tov story. There was a merchant who was minding his business in the store, and a very simple Jew, wearing a plain black suit, walks into the store, asking for tzedakah. And this merchant, looking at the unassuming Jew, figures he's just another beggar, and he says to him, can't you see, I'm busy, I don't have any time to give you tzedakah. Of course, the storekeeper had no idea that this was the great rabbi, Reb Avram Abish of Frankfurt, who I told another story about, episode 201, so make sure to check that out. And the rabbi didn't take any offense, simply turned around and continued begging for money. And a few minutes later, the merchant picked up his coat and his hat because he had a business meeting, and he was about to take his expensive walking stick made of the finest wood, delicately crafted with gold and gemstones on it. But he looked all around and couldn't find his walking stick, his cane. Now in those days, a gentleman, a businessman, a respected one, would never go to a meeting without his hat and his coat and his cane. So the businessman figures, that beggar stole my cane. I didn't give him any money. So he just stole the cane, which is worth a lot more than anything I would have given him. So he rushes out of his store and finds the rabbi walking on the street begging people for money. He grabs him by his coat. He slaps him on the cheek. He says, thief, 
give me back my cane. And the rabbi, he looks at the merchant and he says, I didn't take your cane. Look, there's no place for me to hide it. Do you see I have your cane? Then the merchant slaps him again. He says, don't play games with me. You probably hid it somewhere. Now go get my stick and bring it back to me right away. But the rabbi just shrugged his shoulders and he said, I promise you, my friend, I really didn't take your cane. And the merchant looked him up and down, realizing that he couldn't tell if he really took the cane or not. He figured maybe somebody else took it. He saw that there were posters around town announcing that a great and scholarly rabbi was coming to speak on Shabbos in the great synagogue. And Rav Avish, being a great scholar and a great speaker, filled the shul from one end to the other. Of course, the merchant didn't want to miss the opportunity to hear a great rabbi like Harav Abish. So he went to the shul as well. And when he sees that the crowd parts, the great rabbi steps onto the bima, and he notices that the great rabbi is the beggar who he slapped and accused of stealing his cane, he faints on the spot. And his friends who were standing next to him, they loosened the buttons on his shirt and tried to wake him up. And when he wakes up, he tells them what happened. He didn't know that the rabbi was the rabbi. He thought he was a thief and he stole his cane and he slapped him and accused him. And he said, Oy vey, how could I do something like this? So his friend said, you know what? There's a big crowd here in Shul. When he's finished speaking, everyone's going to go over and wish him a good Shabbos or Yashikoch. You'll go over and apologize in public. What could be better than that? And so the merchant says, okay, I'm going to apologize to the rabbi in public. And he waits in line. And when it's his turn, He's so embarrassed he can't even speak. He's trying to get the words out, but nothing's coming out. And the rabbi recognizes the merchant, of course. And he raises his hands to the heaven and shrugs his shoulders. And he says, believe me, my friend, I don't know who stole your cane. But I promise you, I'm standing in a holy place in this shul. And I did not steal your cane. And at that moment... Hundreds of kilometers away, the Heilig Abal Shemta was sitting with his Hasidim at his Shabbos Tish, and he has a big smile on his face. And when the Hasidim look at one another and then ask the Rebbe, what are you smiling about? He said, do you think there's another Jew like Rav Abish in this whole generation that lacks so much pride and is so humble? He said, Rebbe, what happened? He said, here he is standing in a huge crowd of people that admire him. Torah scholars, Bale Batin, business owners. And here, he sees the guy who accuses him of stealing his cane, and he doesn't even imagine that the merchant had come to apologize. He simply said, I didn't steal the cane. Well, Shem Tov said, that is a truly humble man, because somebody else would have been so hurt and offended that they would have expected the merchant to apologize. But here, this rabbi had worked on himself so much and he was so humble, he didn't need an apology. He didn't expect an apology. And that's why he said, I promise you, I don't know who stole your cane. We should merit to reach that place as well, my sweetest friends. Bezat Hashem. Thank you so much for listening, as always. And thank you, everyone, for reaching out to me. 
especially the Singer Sisters, Maugalit, Shandel, Menucha, Bluma, and Rivka, were the children of Shluchim in Bristol, England. Thank you for reaching out to me, and may you and your parents be successful in your shlichas, spreading the wellsprings outwards, and bringing the Jews that are far, close, but especially to bring the Jews that are close, even closer. So thank you again for listening, my sweetest friends. Make sure to go back and listen to the old stories. They're all really good. And should you like to make a contribution or become a supporter of the podcast, you can go to my website, HasidicStory.com. And until next week, have a wonderful Shabbos. Have a beautiful week. Zai gesund, my sweetest friends. Take care.